This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Well, if you would turn with me in your Bibles, 1 Kings chapter 17, 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning with the first down through the seventh verse, notice these words. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. And then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Kirith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. And so he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Kirith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him meat, bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And we're talking today from the subject, Brook Days and Brook Days. <laughs> brook Days and Brook Days. If you live long enough, you'll have some Brook Days where everything is flowing and you're treating other people to dinner and you buying drinks. I'll leave that right there. <laughs> and then there are other broke days where you got to turn to somebody else that you used to treat and say, you got me today. <laughs> because you realize it's a broke day for you. You have your broke days and you have your, your broke days. And this is where Elijah is. He's at a place where there had been abundance of things and, and then there is a famine that had come out of his own mouth. And we have to really be careful because there are some things that we can do that can cause famine to come in our own life. A famine is the same as an economic depression or recession. It's, it's any time in your life when it's just hard to eat. But there are some good days and there are some bad days. There are some good seasons and, and there are some trying hard seasons. There are times when money is flowing and then there's time where it has stopped flowing. And those are the difference between the brook days and the broke days. And he was escaping here not only uh, for his protection, because as you know, he had spoken these strong words to the king and, and he had to run for his life because Jezebel had told him, listen, I'm going to have your head by this time tomorrow because he'd had all of the 450 prophets of Baal executed. And uh, she said, yeah, he, you're going to die. He had to run for his life. He had just called down fire and done outstanding miracles. And now he's got to run for his life. And sometimes after some of your greatest days come some of your lowest times. And he'd just come from, from ruling and reigning and seeing one of the most spectacular miracles that God could ever do. And uh, now he's running and he's hiding. It's interesting, though, that the name Kirith comes from the ancient Hebrew root, meaning to cut away, to cut up, or to cut off. It is to say that God was sending Elijah here to cut some things away from his life, to cut some things off. This is a pruning place for Elijah. And sometimes God will send you into a brook Kirith, into a Kirith experience in your life. It's not to punish you, it's to prune you. And he's there so that some things can be cut away, so that some things can be cut up or some things could be cut off of his life. You can be holy and still deal with some issues. And so sometimes God will let holy people, good people, righteous people go through a Kirith experience because he needs to cut some things away from you. He's pruning you not to punish you. He's pruning you to make you more productive. And so as, as, as wonderful as a prophet as Elijah was, God still had to send him into a pruning place. It was, it was a place where he needed to be taught how to trust God on a daily. He had to trust God for his daily bread. This is a season of, of drought. 
uh, that had been declared every place else, but God was hiding him by the, uh, the brook Kirith so that he could drink of the, of the brook. And he also had to accept food from ravens, ravens that were unclean fowl. Uh, they, they, they were dirty birds. And uh, God fed him from dirty birds. Listen, when you get desperate, you, you, don't, you don't have to say that, you know, well, I don't eat everybody's potato salad. <laughs> You're just not hungry enough because you, when you get really hungry, you, you eat off the floor. You eat out of a garbage can. When you get, when you, I mean, when you, when you get in survival mode where you haven't eaten in days, it's like you don't want that. And you used to be finicky where you wouldn't eat after anybody. But when you get desperate, desperate people can't afford to be choosy. And so he's in a, in a place where he's, he's, he's gone through brook days and now he's experiencing some brook days and he's got, to, he's got to be fed from dirty birds, some unclean animals. You know, the law of Moses said that ravens were unclean and God uses something unclean to bring him something to save his life. It was dirty. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 13 down through 19, but it, it says this, uh, these are the birds that you are to detest and not eat because they are detestable. And he talked about the eagle, the vulture, the black vulture, the red kite, and any kind of black kite and any kind of raven. And he went on to talk about owls and all kinds of other birds that were dirty birds. And God says, don't eat these. These are dirty birds. These are unclean animals. Call the raven an unclean animal. And yet, uh, in, in verse 4 of 1 Kings 17, notice he says, And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Say there. Yeah. There's an emphasis here really on the word there. God promised that the ravens would feed Elijah as long as he stayed at Kirith, the, the cutting back place. You'll go through some periods in your life where God is just cutting you back from some stuff and so you can't live as large as you did at one season in your life. There are some seasons that you have to cut back. You get a certain, uh, you know, when, you, when you're younger, you can eat what you want and still maintain your figure. But you get at a certain age, you have to cut back, cut back. Because you can eat what you used to eat in your late teens, in your early 20s. But now, if you eat it, it goes immediately to your thighs and your hips, to your midriff. So you get to places, your, your kirith, where you have to cut back. You have to cut it back. And it's interesting that God promised that the ravens would feed Elijah at kirith. So that's why it's important to be where God tells you to be. Because Elijah's provisions weren't where he was, it was where God told him to go. It was where God told him to go. You have to get there, to wherever your kirith is, because that's the direction where God had spoken to the ravens and commanded them, you take bread and flesh in the morning and the evening, take it there to Kirith. Had he been anyplace else, the prayer would have still been answered, but the blessing was going to be delivered at the brook Kirith. You can be at another place, but it's not until you get there that you will experience the divine provision that God has for you. Isn't it interesting that Elijah's provisions uh, they were not where he was. They were where God told him to go. And so that's why you have to get there. For there the ravens have been commanded to feed you. There, in the place called there. Everybody has a there. And there are certain things that have happened to you that were not positive that happened because you were there. And there are some places that you were there and you, you, you regret now that you were there. There are certain people that you wish you had never met. There's some stuff you caught that you wish that you were not there. Uh, you know, there's a lot of contagious stuff. You'll never get it unless you are there. And so we get bad stuff because we are there, but there's some good blessings that God wants for us to have, and it's because you are there. You see, God won't deliver the blessing to you where you are. He'll deliver the blessing to you where you're supposed to go. And it's not until you get into that place 
called there that the ravens, the dirty birds, are going to bring breakfast and dinner every day without fail. They delivered over 2,000 meals there. And I am absolutely convinced that because God commanded the ravens to deliver the meals there, that had Elijah stayed where he was, I believe that the bread and the meat was just going to pile up at Kirith even though he was not there because God is going to send the blessing in the place called there. It's the brook called Kirith. That's, that was the delivery address. And it, wouldn't it be crazy to call up a restaurant and then you order and you tell them the address and if you gave them the wrong address, guess where the food is going? It's going to the wrong address. It's, it's not where you are, it's the address that they have been given. And so the ravens had been given the address, the brook Kirith. So had he stayed in any particular place, he was going to miss what God had already provided for him. There is a provision that is only in the place called there. It's only in the place called there. You have to get to that there. So God was essentially saying to Elijah, you can go wherever you want to go, Elijah, but the address that I'm dropping the food is called Kirith. I'm dropping it off at that address, be there or starve. Be there or starve, and that's why you have to get there. And sometimes you, you might have an impression from God to do something. Maybe you're supposed to start a business. Maybe you're supposed to go back to school. Maybe you're supposed to uh, change jobs or to help somebody else to fulfill a big vision or move to another city or go to Bible school, or get married, or start your family, or write a book, or run for political office, or solve a problem that has frustrated you, or create cultural change, or fight for social justice. It's not until you get there that you'll find the blessing and the provision that God wants you to have. You see, we're standing back saying, God, I can't do what you're asking me to do without first seeing the provision. Show me the money. I mean, what is my compensation package going to look like? Because, you know, I have insurance here and I've got a compensation, uh, retirement compensation package. I mean, Lord, are you asking me to do what? I mean, who, what's, what if I get sick? But you see, you have to be there. The blessing is, is not in the place of security. It is in the place called there where God has commanded the ravens to be able to feed you. It's where those provisions are. And so this is a situation here in 1 Kings 17 that I believe that speaks to your life because God is sending the provision for your needs, not to where you are, but where he told you to go. And when I say where he told you to go, what is it that God has told you to do? What has God put in your heart for you to do in order to serve him? God is sending the provisions not where you are, but where he told you to go. It is that place called there. The question is, are you there? That's the big question. Are you there? Are you there? Ask somebody around you, are you there? Are you there? Are you there? <laughs> it's that place where the provisions are. Are you there? Are you there? This is a real question of deep introspection. Am I there? Am I there? Because the supply is going there. It's a place called there for you. It's not necessarily a location. It may be, uh, be simply a change of attitude. It may be a, 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 a change in how you think because God can't get you there until you start thinking a different way. Uh, there is not just a move across town or to another city, another state because What's going to change for you if you're negative in Atlanta, if you move to Chicago negative? <laughs> or New York negative? Or Dallas negative? Or Philadelphia negative? Or Los Angeles negative? And you're negative here, and you're going to draw negative experiences into yourself. Complaining nails you to your problems. And when you're around a complainer, I promise you, a complainer is going to have, you got, the more you complain about, the more you'll have to complain about. And so sometimes God's just trying to get you there so that you stop talking about how sick you are. He's trying to get you there. You know why? Because you cannot go any place in reality that you've not first been at in imagination. 
God's trying to get you there. He's trying to get you to be able to see on a different level. He says, I'm, 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 I, it is there in that place. Can you, can you see yourself blessed and highly favored? Can you see yourself in a fulfilled marriage? Can you see yourself whole and well and in him living and moving and having your being? If I can get you there, there in your thinking, there in your believing, there in your vision, can I get you there? If I can get you there, because it is there, it is there in that place that I'll provide for you. I'm here to remind you that where God guides, there God provides. Where God leads, there God feeds. God's will is God's bill. Don't ever forget it. There are provisions that are built in for you in the place called there. When you get there, you want to know, Lord, how shall I make it? How shall I make it? When he got a, a little a virgin girl by the name of Mary pregnant with Jesus, she didn't know how she was going to take care of a baby. She's a little girl about 13 or 14 years old when she got pregnant with Jesus. How was she supposed to know? She didn't have a husband. When the angel told her that she was going to conceive and bear a child, she didn't have a husband. How shall these things be? And then the Lord spoke to a man and said, Marry the girl, cover her, but you won't be the daddy of the baby. But he was making provisions. And then uh, she was, this, is, this girl is 13, 14 years old. She believed the word of the Lord. She didn't ain't argue with him and said, how shall this thing be? She said, Lord, be it unto me even according to thy word. And guess what? When she had the baby, she didn't know where the money was coming from. Here come some folks from the east bringing gold and frankincense and myrrh. But it's because she was there. She was there. She'd already had the baby. And we want to have the provisions to be able to see how we're going to educate the child before we even have the baby. I didn't know what I was doing. I had a baby, you know, I was 22 years old. And I had my first child. You don't have to, how am I going to figure this out? They tell me it takes a quarter of a million dollars to raise a child now, up to about age 25. And some of y'all, you know, you get a designer, everything. It's going to be more than a quarter of a million. You have a child, you have no idea. You don't have the money to pay for their college at the time that they come in. But if you're just there, if you, if you get to that place there, there, I've commanded the ravens to feed you. I've commanded, I've got some, it may look like dirty birds. May I just tell you, the biggest dream that you'll ever have come to pass in your life it's generally not going to be because you found some rich investor to say, yeah, I see this. I'm going to bankroll every vision. That, they're not going to bankroll your vision. It's going to be dirty birds, ravens. It's going to be nickel and diamond where you got to put a GoFundMe account. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You got to find some people where you, you get relatives and some friends that believe in you and to start getting 15 cents here and $25 here and another 30 here. And then they start building and God has used little crumbs, just bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening just because you got in that place there. That I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how this is going to turn out. I don't know how I'm going to make my payroll every week. But God, I'm stepping out. I'm going to leave this place. I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to acquire new property. I don't know where I'm going to get the loan to be able to, to, to pay for all of this. But Jesus, I'm going there. I'm going there. God says, if you go there, if you go there, I will meet you there. I've got ravens that will feed you. I'll give you favor. In that place called there, I will heal you. I will deliver you. I'll set your mind at ease. I'll give you rest for your soul. I'll let you prosper even when relatives around you are talking about you and waiting on you to fail. God said, I'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemy. I'll let them see it. I'm not going to bless you in the boot, in the back, in the corner, in the dark. I'm going to do it so that they will know this is the Lord's doing. They'll see you talking wide-eyed and about some dreams and vision. And God says, I will bless you if you'll just go there. You don't have to know how. You simply know that and get there. Get there. Get there. Get up from the place where you are and go there. I will show you. There. I'll give you everything you need. You're going without a son, but you're going to have a son there. You're not going to get your son until you get there. You're not going to get your daughter until you get there. You're not going to get your business until you get there. Your dream is not going to come to pass until you get there. Get in that place called there because everything that you need is provided. You don't have to figure it all out ahead of time. You just get there, just get there, just get there, just get there, just go there, go there. 
you got to get up from the place where you are and say, i got to get out of here. I've got to go there. It's better to be in a place where the blessings of God are with you in there, even when there looks unstable, even when there looks dangerous. When it looks dangerous, it's better for you to be in the will of God in a dangerous place than to stay in a place of what you think is safety outside of his will. I went down to south in, in, in Colombia, Bogota, Colombia, the cocaine capital of the world. And it's amazing. As soon as I got there, there were all kinds of militia folks in the airport and lining up every street all down the street where my hotel was. It, it was things were so dangerous there, we had to bring in the military to protect me in the meeting that I was doing, speaking to 5,000 men in the Coliseum. But I felt more at peace being in a dangerous country because I was in the will of God. Then had I been at home in my bed outside of the will of God because a tree could have fallen on my house and one of the branches could have punctured the roof and come down and impale my body and I could have thought that I was in a safe place out of the will of God, you will be surprised. You can get killed sitting on the bus in what you might think is a safe place, in a safe country. But when you go in a dangerous place in the will of God, it's better than to stay in a safe place outside of his will. But when you go there, 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 and I, and I went and preached in one of the, 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 the pastor's uh, towns there when I'm, I'm in, in Bogota, and it was interesting that they tell me that the, the folks that worked on the coffee bean, because you know a lot of folks drink Colombian coffee, their workers were paid $7 an hour. But if you worked on the cocaine plantation, $21 an hour. The pastor's brother worked on the cocaine uh, plantation and he got saved in the meeting and went to his folks and said, I can't do this anymore. And they said, you'll never leave this business alive. And he walked out of the field and they shot him in the back and killed him. But when I preached in the pastor's church the next day, the power of the Holy Ghost was poured out on that house. Are you listening to me? I went to a dangerous place at a dangerous time. And, and, and yet when I got there, the power of the Holy Spirit was so poured out over this place. I meant to the degree, I've never had an outpouring like that since. 75% of the church that day received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And a medical doctor came up to me and he said, I had a dream last night that a man from America came to our church and the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church. And I was that man. It is amazing when you go there, when you go there, when you go there, when you go there, there are the provisions. I wouldn't have had that kind of anointing sitting at home in my own home church. But when you go there, Everything that you need is in that place called there. It's in that place called there. And so there are people, whenever you go through broke times or brook times, there is a place called there. The, the key is, is to be in the place where God has called you to. And see, maybe you, you've got a word from God that you have not acted on. See, nothing can happen until you act on it, until you get there. Most of the time, we're standing around waiting on God, but God is actually waiting on us to get there. He's waiting on us. You remember when Elisha had, had provided this, this, this same Elijah had uh, decreed this uh, drought and that there won't be rain until at, at my saying so? And then you remember when he says, it's going to rain now, come on rain? And he sent his service, he bowed his head between his knees, got into the birthing position. There's something you've got to birth out in prayer. Once he spoke the word of the Lord and he put his head between his knees and he began to birth this, this thing out and he sent his servants and said, go check and see, nothing. Go check again, nothing. Go check again, nothing. See, successful people don't give up the first time. They don't give up the second time. They don't give up the third time. They don't give up the fourth time. He went on the seventh time that servant came back and said, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. He said, prepare your chariot. You better get ready because it's getting ready to pour down. And, and I mean, the king, he went off in his chariot and I, the, the spirit of the Lord came on Elijah. Elijah outran the horse. 
I'm, I'm telling you, when you go there, when you go there, my God, I'm telling you, he says, if you don't get out of here now, you better go because the rain is getting ready to come. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Touch your neighbor. Say, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. My God. When you get there, I'm just telling you, when you get there, it's going to rain. You, it's going to rain. And I'm telling you, because Elijah obeyed God, it put him on the map. Because he took a risk. It put him on a map and he became known to that nation because God gave him a word and he acted on it. And it put him on the map. Had he sat in a conservative place and had he never gone there, he never would have been developed. He had to go to a place where he was cut back. If you're ever going to build something, you're going to have to cut back. You can't build a business and still live in large at the same time. You got to sacrifice for something. Something must decrease as something must increase. It was John the Baptist that said in, uh, in, in St. John chapter 3 and verse 30, he said, he must increase, I must decrease. And every time there's a balance, there's a balance. It's whatever you want something to increase, you got to decrease this. If you want an increase of supernatural provision, you got to, you got to decrease this, this, this stuff. He's turn your plate down. You, you, you decrease your natural provision. You'll increase your supernatural provision. You increase your, your leaning on, on, on your own understanding. You, you decrease that and you, God will increase his supernatural wisdom and divine guidance in your life. There must be a, a balance of something that happens in our life when, when we go there. But because he did that, because Elijah obeyed God, when he stepped out on faith, uh, he became a dominant figure in that nation. He was blessed and miracles began to happen. And a person was raised from the dead through his ministry and revival broke out in his life, you know, because God had ordained him. Let me just remind you of this, that everything, everything that God has for you is waiting in a place called obedience. Everything that God has for you is waiting for you in a place called obedience. There's something that God is waiting on you to do. He's waiting on you to do. He's waiting on you to do. Sometimes you don't get your healing. He would tell a blind man, go and wash in the pool called Siloam, and then thou shalt come again seeing. The word Siloam means sit, sit. There's some place that God is sending you, and the blessing is going there. It is going there. It is going there. Remember the ten lepers? The Bible says they were healed as they went, went. You've got to be on your way somewhere, and then God will open up blessing in your life. You better be on your way somewhere, on your way. Touch your neighbor say, I'm on my way somewhere. I'm on my way somewhere. I'm on my way somewhere. You're not designed to be static. You are on your way. You're a blessing on your way someplace to happen. But it's because you're on your way. You don't have to be there. Just be on your way and God will go with you. He'll go with you. God will go with you. You may not understand at the current time why God is doing what he chooses to do when he separates you from your comfort zone and brings you into that place called there in that pruning place, the place of the cutting away and cutting back and cutting off. There are some people in your key that God will cut you off of your Facebook. He'll cut you off of talking to certain people on your telephone. He'll cut them off and because God says, I'm going to do something in your life that I'm not doing with your friends. And I'm just telling you, when you get ready to do, really do some of these things, it becomes a lonely place, a lonely place. He didn't go to Kirith with all his family and have a family reunion down in Kirith. People don't want to come to you when you're in a cutback. Just, just lose your job and, and be off for a few weeks and see how many folks will come around and invite you out to dinner. You, you're in your Kirith. Don't get sick too long because you'll be in your Kirith and they, and they folks won't even come by to see you. They won't even ask you how you're doing any longer because you're in your Kirith. But you see, while you're cut back, God's setting you up for something. He's working on something. He's working on something. You see, God will often take us through unexpected turns in life. He'll often take us through unexpected turns. And see, when man turns, it's called repentance. When God turns, it's called revelation. And when God and man turn, it's called revolution. But he's on his way. God's working on something. God is working on something. That's something that you have to turn, turn, turn. And in the midst of the turning, when you repent, there's a new revelation that will come. And out of your revelation is birth a revolution. All real, genuine revelation produces a revolution in your life, a revolution in your thinking, a revolution in how you believe and how you act and what you do and where you go. 
Isn't it amazing that Elijah prayed for drought and then yet he experienced God's provision in a time where everybody else was having drought? But these were dirty birds, dirty birds. And God will send you to a place that's sometimes uncomfortable and in your key this is the place where you're being cut back and you may not understand, God, why am I having a hard time right now? Why am I having a hard time? May I just remind you of this, that purpose outlasts pain. Purpose outlasts pain. Purpose outlasts pain. You can be hurting. You can be hurting, but I'm just telling you, there are times, I cannot tell you the time when I sometimes don't feel like going. But I realize that I'm born for purpose. And I'm not here for my own convenience. And so I've said, Lord, I've got to go even though I don't feel like going right now. Because purpose outlives pain. Purpose outlives pain. There's some time when a mother has children that are depending on her. She doesn't have the luxury of saying, baby, I don't feel good today. Because she realized that if mama doesn't work, mama doesn't eat. And see, purpose outlives pain. That means you got to sometimes carry yourself in while you're hurting. You got to still work while you got a headache that's splitting open. You got to go, and it's because purpose outlives pain. You're going because somebody else is depending on you. You, you, you're going not because you want to go. It's not because you're so addicted to it and you're so in love with that place and those people. <laughs> it is because purpose outlives pain. Purpose outlives pain. Purpose outlives pain. That's something that God's working on. Have you ever wondered sometimes, why does God let things dry up? Why? Why, why does he let things dry up? I believe it's because he wants to teach us not to trust in his gifts, but in him. Why does God let things dry up? Why? Why? Why would he send you to a place that he knows is going to dry up? Why does he give you an idea that only works for a season? Why? Why? God, God knew it was going to dry up when he sent you there. Why does God let things dry up? I think it's so that we won't just depend on ourselves. He, he sent the apostles and let them wait for 10 days to let them drain themselves of themselves before while they were waiting for Pentecost. Things had to drain out of them. He wants us to depend upon the water that flows from his throne and not the water even from the brook that he led us to. God wants us to depend on him. Notice when he said in, in, in verse 1 of, of, of 1 Kings 17, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. You see, the reason being because King Ahab was king over a nation where Baalism dominated. And Baalism is a fertility code religion. And Baal is uh, assumed to be a sky god. He was the god of weather, weather. So when the prophet Elijah is saying that no, 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 Baal is not God. That's not going to, he's the God of weather. We'll see whether he's the God of weather again because there will not be rain until my word. And see, the name Elijah means Yahweh is my God. It was in total defiance of Baalism. His very name, his very nature spoke and said, I'm getting ready to bust this mess up in this country. It's like, no, 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 no. This Baalism, this fertility code, all of this sex that's going on out of control here with, with sex, sex slaves in the temple where folks went to worship and had sex with folks at the temple in order to wor worship Baal and Ashtaroth. All of this kind of fertility code religion. He's the, the, the God of weather that, that would rain down and bless their crop, so to speak. He says, if he is, there'll be no rain and I'll show you whether he's God or not. Yahweh is God. That's what the name Elijah El it means. Yahweh is my God. And so he's in a, in a whole culture where Ahab and his government support Baalism. So Elijah's presence and everything that he does prophetically is in defiance of that pagan culture where he was living. And I'm telling you this, if you just act on the word of God and, and go there, it can change your life. It'll change your life. And God might bring stuff to feed you while you're in that place called there from dirty birds, these ravens, unclean birds. But isn't it amazing how there can be something unclean about them and yet they can bring you clean food? Charles Spurgeon said, 
But see too how possible it is for us to carry bread and meat to God's servant and do some good for his church and yet be ravens still. Still ravens, dirty birds, dirty birds. God has a purpose for ravens. He can use ravens. I mean, in Genesis chapter 8, verse 6 and 7, uh, Noah sent a raven out of the ark. It was a raven that he sent out. I wonder why he sent a raven. You know why? Because ravens are scavengers. They'll eat the, the, uh, the flesh of other putrefying bodies. And you see, there were dead carcasses that were floating on the waters that had not yet abated. And so he sent a raven out, knowing that if they got stuck out there, they could still feast off of things and, and, and be scavengers to the, to the debris that was still floating on the water. He used a raven. He used a raven. And so despite that negative image, God still cares for ravens, and he feeds them. Uh, Psalm 147 in verse 9 says that he gives to the beast their food and to the young ravens that cry. God feeds the, the ravens that cry, the young ravens that cry. God is concerned even about young dirty birds. He feeds them. God feeds them. He feeds them. Jesus reminded us in Luke chapter 12, verse 24, he says, Consider the ravens. They do not sow nor reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. Isn't it amazing that God can use you as a dirty bird? You don't have to be perfect. And he still uses people with issues and problems. And God still takes care of you. You don't even know how in the world you're able to make do sometime on your little salary. But God is still taking care of you as a raven. He, he feeds them. And don't you know the same God that takes care of the raven, a dirty bird? He cares so much more for you. But isn't it amazing that when you are in your, uh, when God sends you to uh, your Kirith experience and you're having brook days where the water is flowing and then all of a sudden you have broke days where the water stops flowing. And now you're dealing with a broke situation. But even when the water is flowing, he's got you in a place where you can't save anything. And when you're in that place where you can't save anything, see, the, the, the birds couldn't even bring him a day's supply. They would only bring him a, enough for half a day. They brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and then they came back in the evening with dinner. He didn't even give you the full daily supply at one time. Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And so at least the ravens could have brought breakfast and dinner at the same time. They brought breakfast, and then they brought dinner later on. They just, they brought it in shifts. They served 2,000 meals to Elijah while he's at Kirith. 2,000 meals. But God had him in a place where he couldn't have any surplus. There are some seasons in your life where you can't even save money. And it's, 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 it can be ordained of God, but God is teaching you to trust me as your daily supply. And, and I don't mean that it's a sin for you to have, a, 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 you know, food in your refrigerator and, and meat in your freezer. I, I don't mean that it's a sin to do that because you can have a full freezer and a full refrigerator, but there are more needs that you have than just food and drink. When you get a certain age, every day you wake up, you need some oil on your joints. <laughs> you need him to help your knees and, and your back. You need him to touch your digestive tract and your respiratory system. I mean, you, you're gonna have something that you're gonna, you, you need him for your vision and your hearing, huh, huh? <laughs> you need him daily bread, every day. It's like Jesus, enough strength today, enough strength. You, you, sometimes your daily bread is just, it's the patience to be able to keep from killing your spouse. It's, just, it's daily bread, it's Lord, I, 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 give me strength, God, to just, just to love him, Jesus. Help me, help me. And the brother's like, Lord, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. Hold me, Jesus. Hold me, Jesus. No, this woman didn't just, uh, hold, hold me, Jesus. And that may be your daily bread, your daily bread just to have your sanity. And I'm just telling you, anybody that has children need him for your daily bread. Every day. You don't know what stupid thing your child will do this day. Lord, what is it that they're calling me about now? Jesus, 
Give us this day our daily bread. There's a reason that God still wants you to have to trust him for something every day. Every day, every day. Trust him for something every day. There's a reason he could have ordained them to come and bring a whole month full of stuff at one time. A whole year's worth of stuff. That's the way we would have wanted. Give me a whole year. I'm so glad that God didn't give you all of the money when you were born because many of us would have been broke at five years old. You needed him to ration it out. Thank God he didn't give you all of the money while you were smoking weed. You needed him to ration your money out. You would have been so drunk and so high. Thank God. Thank God that he didn't give you all of the money at once. He just, your daily bread, your daily bread, your daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. He wants us to trust him for something every day. God never designed for mankind to live independent of him. He says, I need you to trust me. Trust me that, that I will keep you. Trust me for wisdom. Trust me for understanding. Trust me, trust me, trust me, so that I will give you even the fortitude in, in strength. If you're in business, you got to have fortitude to know how to hire slowly and fire quickly. It, 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 it takes a wisdom of God. God, I need you today as my daily bread. I, I need you as my daily bread because you do go through brook, brook days and then you go through brook days. And God has to be our daily bread, our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And you know, I love it how Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 8 and 9 in English Standard Version reads for us. Notice this. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. You hear what the writer was asking here? He says, God, don't give me so much surplus in my life that I never need you. And I say that I don't even have need of you, Lord, because I've, I've, I've already got my money. And I've got the money to afford good doctors. I, I, I don't really need you. I don't need you. And then he says, don't let me be so poor that I have to steal to try to support myself and my family. So that it, it, it holds us in this tension, this tension between brook days and broke days. And here we are vacillating in, in this, this holy conundrum. If we get too much, then we won't depend on him. And if we don't have enough, it'll tempt us to cheat, to try to get it, to manipulate, to steal, to try to get it. And, and he's in this place. He's just being real. He says, uh, don't, 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 make me, don't make me rich and, and, and don't, don't, don't make me poor. Give, give me enough of what I need, of what I need. Just, just give me what I need. Give us this day, our daily bread, that, that enough to meet the daily needs in our life today. I don't want to ever get to a place where I don't have to trust God. And that's why you have to always have a vision that is bigger than where you are. Because your big vision will always keep you dependent upon God. But when your brook is flowing all the time and you've never experienced broke days, you get it twisted. And sometimes you can begin to think that my ingenuity and by making all of the right contacts and, and going to the right schools and dotting all of my I's and crossing all of my T's has gotten me this, look, and I will build bigger barns. And then God will say, thou fool, this night your soul is required of you. And then to whom shall your barns belong? We have to depend upon him each day for our daily bread. And may I just remind you that the Lord has plenty of ravens to supply the needs of his children. He has plenty of ravens to supply the needs of his children. And let me just tell you this. God knows where you are when you are there and your grocery list is written on his heart. Your grocery list is written on the heart of God. He already knows. He's got ravens to supply your needs and your grocery list is written on his heart. And he's appointed there to be the beginning and the ending of every season in your life. God has appointed the beginning and the ending of every season. So when you're in brook days, it has an appointed time. It has an appointed time. 
In 1 Kings 17, uh, 7, it says, sometime later, the brook dried up. Sometime later. But in the original Hebrew, it actually means at the end of days. When that season had served its purpose, then it dried up. It, it dried up at the end of the days that it was appointed by God. And that became the critical sign that it was time for him to move because he had to trust God. He had to trust God with all of his heart. And then it brings us to this place that God will do whatever is necessary because our God is in heaven and he does whatever pleases him. Psalm 115 in verse 3. And he reminds us of this. And, and then once he did that, he actually led Elijah the prophet when that brook dried up because it had only been for an appointed time, it was for a season and not a lifetime. It was for a season because God's a moving thing. And this might have met your, your needs at this point in your life, but what used to meet your needs no longer meets your needs. Because you get a certain age. Your bones need a different kind of support to keep from losing bone density. And you got to feed yourself not for where you used to be. You got to feed yourself for where you are and for where you're going. Uh, you feed yourself for where you are because this is what I got to work with. But you got to say, you know what? I'm not trying to die at 60 or 62 or 65. And isn't it amazing that the closer that you get to certain ages, the younger it appears? Some people didn't know how young 70 is. You didn't know how young 75 was. You didn't know how young 80 and 85 and... 90. You, you, you don't really know how young a certain age is until you, until you get there. But if you're 50 and you're trying to get to 75, you got to eat for where you're going. A teenager is not eating for where he's going. He's just eating. <laughs> he has no thought. He feels invincible. She's at the varsity with chili dogs and onion rings. It has no concern about what is going to settle on her hips and thighs. She's not eating for where she's going. She's eating for where she is. But you've got to eat for where you're going. And when the brook dried up and he'd finish eating from that, those brook days and the ravens didn't show up. He knew it was time to move, and now God says to him, Get up and go to Zarephath, for there I have commanded a widow woman. And he sent him from dirty birds to a broke poor woman, because back in that day there were no rich widows. When a woman's husband died, she was doomed to poverty. She had no insurance policy that she was a beneficiary of, she had no pension that she could draw from from his life. She was destitute and poor. And here this woman was. Now all she has is a, is a container of flour and a cruise of oil. And God now says, I've been your daily bread at the brook Kirith, and now I'm going to be your daily bread in Zarephath because I've commanded a widow, but she doesn't know yet. But I've made it to where she's going to take care of you until this thing is over. And he went from eating the crumbs, little pieces of bread that birds could bring him, to eating a whole cake. Because he told this widow woman, make me a cake. And she said, are you crazy? I'm going to make my last meal for me and my son before we die. He says, you know, do that, but make one for me first. And isn't it amazing that God did not give her just tons and tons of flour to last for three years? You know why? Because when you're in a famine situation and everybody else around her was having a hard time eating, had the news gotten out that homegirl had barrels and barrels and barrels and barrels of flour and oil, they would have broken in her house, maybe killed her and her son just to get her stuff because they're in survival mode. And God had to say, I've got to find a way to be able to bless my daughter to where the folks around her won't try to rob her of a blessing. And so he said, I won't let them see it. So every time she scoops a cup out, I'll put it back. Every day, 
I'll meet a need and they won't even understand how the need is being met. So I'm not going to give her 25 barrels to last her for three years. Every day though when she takes it, every time that she pours an ounce of oil out, I'll put another ounce back. And she'll find that it'll never run dry and that it'll never be noised around. They'll never hear that she's got, the, and they won't even be able to figure out how you were able to educate your children on this little bit. They won't even be able to understand how you were able to put food on your table and clothes on your back and, and keep your utilities going because you were operating with little stuff. You just had a barrel, just a little thing of meal and a little cruise of oil and they didn't understand how God didn't let that thing get down. And this is why when you're in your brook days, trust him in the broke days. The same God, the same God, the same God that was faithful to you in the brook days is God in the broke days. You don't love him any less because you're in a broke day. He is the same God of the broke days as he is of the broke day. He, we love him because he is God. We love him because he is faithful. And I'm just here to declare to you that God has some things ordained for you in that place called there. He's waiting on you to let such a spirit of boldness rise up in your life so that you can possess everything that God wants. He's got provision, supernatural provision, unseen provision, secret riches of hidden places, things that you don't even know of. God's got it hidden, hidden. It's not gonna look like what it is. He's hiding it from greedy people so he can give it to desperate people. I'm just here to let you know that God has some things in that place called there. If you will go there, if you will go there, if you'll say, Lord, I will go where you want me to go and I will do what you want me to do. Stop thinking that your greatest opportunity is where you are. Your greatest opportunity is seeing a land and God says, if you'll walk it, if you'll go this place, I'll give it all that your eye can see. If you'll go there, I'll go with you. Get up, Abraham, and go to a place and I will be with you and I will bless you and I will multiply you. He went there. They couldn't see the seed that he was carrying. He was carrying nations in him, but they couldn't see it. He carried blessings in him that bless us today. And that same God is faithful to us today. And if you trust him, and if you go there, even though you may say, God, I don't have round trip money. I don't have enough to finish the project. If you go there, he's got a partner waiting for you. There is a widow woman in Zarephath. Somebody that's got a hookup. Somebody that will be used to take what you're doing to the next level. What are you waiting for? Your provisions are in the place called there. I don't know who I'm talking to in this place today, but I do realize that in that place called there, 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 God will use ravens, little things with little resources to bless the socks off of you, to sustain you in ways where you didn't understand where the money was going to come from and how am I going to make it in this difficult place. Little becomes much when it's in the master's hand. You will be surprised when somebody brings their little. God's got some stuff in the place called there. He's got hookups. He's got relationships. He's got connections there. There's healing for you there. There's deliverance for you there. There is salvation there. There's wisdom there. There's joy there. There is peace there. There is love there. I'm here to tell you when you get there, when you get there, get up from the place where you are and go there, go there, go there, go there. There is the blessing, there. He commands the blessing. How good and how pleasant it is for men to dwell together in unity. For there, 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 the blessing is commanded, commanded. It is commanded, it's commanded. There's a power that begins to flow from God when you get there. When you say, Lord, I'm willing to obey you. I'm willing to go and to do what you want me to do. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't understand it, Jesus, but I'm going with all of the faith that is in my heart. I'm going with what you've entrusted into my heart. I'm going to do what I can do, God, with what you've given me to do. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. And I declare to you, that when you get there, when you get there, he's got ravens, he's got widows, he's got business people, he's got marketing people, 
He's got accountants. He's got lawyers. He's got bankers. He has people there to help you that have been commanded of the Lord to bless your life. When you go at his word, when you go at his word, when you go at his word, you don't have to see the way to know the way. You walk with the one who is the way and he'll send everything that you need in your life and the blessings of God will overtake you. I declare to you that you'll be able to survive the broke days and the broke days because the same God is a God that is over both. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.